Hello, um, thank you all for joining for the event today. Um, this is the third in a series of five events this week to coincide with the publication of the new issue of The Philosopher, which is the journal that is organizing um, this lecture series. So um, the events are generally featuring people who've contributed um, essays to the, the new issue. So tonight I'm delighted that Faye Bound Alberti is, um, is with us. She contributed an essay which was called Wanliness and Loneliness um, and the, the subtitle um, From We to I. So this is the sort of linking in with the theme. And Faye's a historian based at the University of York. And a lot of you will know um, that around the time of the, the arising of the pandemic, there was suddenly a flurry of reviews of Faye's book, um, A Biography of Loneliness, that came out last year through Oxford University Press. And I guess some, some books just captured the zeitgeist, especially as there was another one, coincidentally, that came out this year, which was, um, I think it's called A History of Solitude by David Vincent. So there were numerous reviews bringing Faye's and David's book into productive discussion. So obviously loneliness has become a major theme of life in the um, post COVID world. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. And joining Faye very much on a sort of um, equal level rather than in conversation with because he has also authored um, a book on loneliness is Lars Svensson, a philosopher based at the University of Bergen, who a lot of people will know. I was chatting with him before the event started. And I said, I know your work through your book on boredom. And he was like, oh. So that was over 20 years ago. Um, Lars wrote a brilliant book on boredom, something that most people wouldn't really think is an obvious topic for philosophical reflection. But over the years, he's gone on to write books on fear, on work, on evil, on freedom, more recently on animal minds. And I understand there's a book coming out on lying. But in 2017, Lars published A Philosophy of Loneliness. So we have a biography of loneliness written by a historian and a philosophy of loneliness written by a philosopher. So that will be the, the framing for the event today. So just in terms of the basics, Faye and Lars will be in conversation for around half an hour or so. Um, during that time, please feel free to send anything to the chat chat function that you want to share with the fellow audience members. Maybe tell us where you're from, tell us any thoughts you have on loneliness, your own experience of loneliness. If you, like me and Lars and Faye, are locked down, not every nation is, but Norway and England are at the moment. So, um, and then if you want a question asked, please send that to the Q&A bit at the bottom of the screen. So the chat things for just public discussion, the Q&A things for questions that you would like asked after that conversation. And please keep them relatively short if possible. So I think that's everything I need to say. So I'll now um, hand over to Faye and Lars to kick things off. Thanks very much, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and I'm look for, looking forward to this conversation with you. Uh, and I thought that we should probably begin by, if not defining, then at least describing the phenomenon we're talking about, because loneliness is so often confused with related phenomena, such as aloneness, when they in fact they are, okay, there are links there, but they are empirically and conceptually distinct. So. Let's just start there. Mm. What is loneliness? How would you describe it? It's a really important question as well, isn't it? Because so much discussion at the moment about an epidemic of loneliness takes for granted that loneliness is a thing. It's a definite yeah. state and it's an emotion. Um, and I would refute all of those presumptions. Um, my interpretation of loneliness is a sense of emotional disconnect between the relationships that we have and those that we want. I don't think it's always a negative emotional state, although that's something that has been interpreted as inevitable given our concern for the epidemic of loneliness. Um, 
And also, as a historian of emotion, I'm very interested in how emotions become labelled, how they become internalised, how they become reproduced. And for me, it's very important that we view loneliness not as a single emotional state, but as an emotional cluster. Because, yeah. of course, whether or not um, whatever kind of emotion is entangled with loneliness depends on your state and your experience. So somebody who lives in an old people's home and their peers have died and they are never seeing anybody will have a very different quality of loneliness which is entangled with grief uh, and isolation to that of a young boy playing computer games all the time and having no friends so understanding the complexity of emotions involved in loneliness is for me very important yeah i yeah. I, I, yeah, I fully agree i mean the shortest description i could probably give of loneliness would be uh, a social withdrawal in analogy with a drugs withdrawal, a feeling of discomfort or pain that tells us that our need for attachment to others is not being met, mm. but it can be failed. It, it, it can fail to be met in so many different ways. Mm. Uh, so I think that that's an important issue to say that there is a variety here, which yes. we should respect, where it's often in the mass media presented as a pretty uniform phenomenon, which it isn't. Yeah, that's right. And I think also this emphasis um, on withdrawal, akin to drug withdrawal, is really important because, of course, another aspect of this is that um, loneliness is felt very much in the body. So for, for historically specific reasons, which is the emergence of the mind sciences and the construction of the individual, we tend to think about loneliness as a mental health problem. But loneliness is embodied and it's experienced physically. And people talk about loneliness in ways that are very physical, which are about coldness, um, which are about a feeling of lack inside and physically. Um, and I think tending to that, whether we see it as akin to drug withdrawal or whether we see it as, um, as akin to a kind of need for a physical connection in the way that social neuroscientists might, I think that kind of language needs to be brought back in, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah and, and uh, the physical aspect is interesting. I mean, it, we could describe it as, well as a social pain. Mm. And of course, it follows the same neural paths as ordinary physical pain. And there has even been a few experiments in which one tried to give people who reported feeling lonely, they gave them painkillers, mm. and they reported that, yeah, the feeling wasn't as intense after getting the painkillers. So there's definitely a physical aspect mm. there. But I suppose, yeah, what attaches to that too is this also this, this um, development of a loneliness pill, yeah. which I find fascinating, but also deeply problematic. Yeah. Because of course, um, whether it's in philosophy or in history, we know that emotions are socially contextual. Um, yeah what we feel is very dependent on our social circumstance. So the idea that um, all emotions are bad, including loneliness, and the idea that we should seek to suppress and to numb our emotions, I think is really problematic because of course they, they can be guides to inform us how to live. Absolutely, I, th I think it's pretty much to also see emotions as cognitive instruments. Uh, in my old book on boredom, I describe boredom as a voice of conscience telling you that you have to actually change how you live uh, your life and, and so on. Mm. But one thing I would like to touch on is, of course, this, you argue that loneliness is a modern emotion. Yeah. And, and I do not yeah. take it to mean that only in the last two centuries have people felt discomfort uh, due to insufficient attachment to others. I mean, there are descriptions of pain, of not having anything to turn to uh, in biblical writings, and uh, the ancient Greek philosophers described the misfortune of not having friends and family, especially Aristotle, of course, but uh, yeah. I, was, I recently wrote this book on lying, and Plato has this fascinating description of how the liar eventually will become lonely. He will be deprived of his friends and family and, and so on. So, so I mean, th this whole idea that we are social animals and if we do not have certain attachment to others, we will be deprived of something pretty mm. crucial. That idea is, is fairly old. So I'd rather take you to mean that there is a certain discourse that's being formed, a certain way of framing an experience rather that emerges over the last two centuries. Uh, I mean, something happens here in at least the second part of the 17th century. I'm more familiar with the German literature yes, than with, with the English here. So something happens there with the discourse, but yeah. 
you, you can take it on from there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different things that are being confused, though, when we think about it this way, because, yes, people spoke about being lonely uh, in the biblical period and people wrote about being lonely in Shakespeare. But the word has changed. Um, as a historian of emotion, I'm very interested in how words evolve and they take on different meanings. Lonely just meant wanly, and wanly just meant in solitude. And the reason why I think that's so, so important is that the whole idea of the individual being alone in the world is uh, a relatively modern phenomenon. If you are a monk in the wilderness um, and you're living out your days in solitude, you may become lonely, but that would simply mean that you were solitudinous. The mind view was such that if you are completely assured that your place in the world is guaranteed by a, a, a deity that may be benevolent or may be unkind, but it's there, there's a sense of one's existence having meaning. So in tracing the emergence of loneliness as a distinct emotional lack, as opposed to oneliness as a state of being, what we find is that in Western sources in particular in the UK, we have this emergence of loneliness as an emotional word round about 1800. And prior to that, we simply don't find it. Now, I think that this is very much related to different ways of viewing the individual and different ways of living. And this internalization of a sense of responsibility for one's own fate. So it might not have been um, perfect and certainly wasn't for many people in the early modern period, for example, but there was an assurance that one's life had purpose, however imperfect it might have been. And it's that that I think has produced um, modern sense of alienation, which was characterized by existential philosophers in the early 20th century. Um, so I think we have a sort of difference of opinion as a philosopher and a historian yeah. on the sort of meanings and origin of loneliness. Yeah. I, I guess my views have changed a little bit there over the years. Usually, uh, earlier, for instance, when, when, when I did my old book on boredom, I described it as a very modern phenomenon. I sort of pushed it further and further back into history as, as time ha has gone on. I mean, but there, there is continuity and there is difference. Um, but, but I would definitely agree that there is certainly a change in how a certain experience is being framed. And, and that is definitely connected to the emergence of modern individualism. I mean, there's no disagreement between us there. Um, where we go from there to a certain underlying, more stable phenomenon or so on, I mean, that, yeah, that's a different issue. Um, I mean, your book is also devoted to exploration of specific stories of loneliness, such as the loneliness of Queen Victoria and Sylvia Plath. Mm. Um, that is women's stories of loneliness. And, uh, and, and I think that it's interesting uh, th this area because there is a gender difference here. Um, of course, different studies show different results as they do to a great extent in this field, because I mean, the results various empirical studies they're really all over the place uh, but if i say that most studies show that there is a gender difference here with women reporting lonely feeling lonely mm. to a larger degree than men i mean it seems to be a fairly common finding uh, and in some cases it's fairly obvious why this should be so for instance, if we look at the elderly, it's it's not very surprising that the elder, elderly women feel lonelier to a greater extent, simply because they live longer. Many of them will have lost their husbands and, and, and so on. But, but we find it, there's no, there is no difference between small children. After that, a gender difference seems to emerge and it seems to remain throughout life. And, we would expect the opposite, wouldn't we? Given the fact that women have stronger social bonds. I mean, they, they, they have stronger social networks. They are better at uh, finding new friends if old friendships are lost. I mean, all of these things would make us assume that more men than women would be lonely. 
but uh, different sociological studies suggest that it's the other way round. Um, and of course, there are other gender differences, such as we find that men who are huge fans of a football team tend to feel less lonely than men who are not fans of a football team or identifying with something like that, or their, the university they went to, perhaps even their nation. We do not find the same sort of effect in women. So there is a gender difference here. Um, I think there are gender differences. I think it's really important to think about different patterns of sociability. Um, football yeah. is a very dis description. I mean, uh, as uh, in terms of nurture, women tend to be encouraged to develop and sustain and build relationships in ways that men do not. On the other yeah. hand, women are much more likely to report feeling lonely because they have the skills of social, um, being able to describe what they're feeling. They're allowed to. Um, they're allowed to describe feelings of of not being happy in a way that we know men feel more uncomfortable with. Um, and so I think that there are sociological studies that show differences, but it's also critical to look at how age, ethnicity, race intersects with these two so that it tends to be later in life that men feel most lonely when they're retired and their sense of identity is lost through work, for instance. So that's one classic trope that we see, isn't it? But for women, um, loneliness comes as with men at any particular life stage that forces people to re-evaluate re what their role is, whether that's motherhood or marriage or divorce or any of the things um, that we find on our journey through life. And while I do focus, as a feminist historian, I'm particularly interested in women's stories. I do talk about stories of men as well, including Thomas Turner in my yeah. um, biography of loneliness. But I'm very interested in the ways in which gender plays out uh, in these conversations, because, of course, how we feel in terms of our loneliness or our emotional well-being, these are really connected to how we view female bodies, male bodies, our sense of our capacities and capabilities of being human, along with issues of ethnicity and race and age. So all of this needs untangling in the ways in which we currently look at loneliness as some sort of epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned the term the epidemic. Uh, it's reported remarkably often that we are in the midst of a loneliness epidemic. Uh, as you know, I'm pretty critical of such claims, and I can perhaps expand on that later, but, but uh, I did something that's almost unheard of for a philosopher when I wrote my book. Uh, I got access to the raw data from the Norwegian uh, Health Service. Uh, I mean, Norwegians were probably the most investigated population on earth. I mean, uh, no no Norwegians really were the wet dream of any social scientist. You can find out anything about us. So I, I got the raw data and actually started crunching numbers, doing statistics, which I had never dreamt of doing when I started doing philosophy which of course you think that oh, I can leave all that empirical stuff behind and simply do conceptual analysis. Um, and what I found was that we have reliable data for the last uh, four decades and it hasn't changed at all, which came as a huge surprise to me because I was absolutely convinced that it would have risen sharply. And the reason why I decided to write the book on loneliness was because prior to that, I'd written a book on freedom and how we'd sort of gotten freedom wrong, taking this idea of negative liberty as an ideal for living rather than as a tool for arranging certain parts of the political landscape. So, uh, but it turned out it had not changed at all. Mm. And from there, I've looked at other countries and of course, uh, as I said, there are different studies show different things. Uh, some, show, some show an increase, some a decrease, but the general find most places is really that it hasn't changed much for decades. Um, and then we're hardly talking about an epidemic, are we? Well, people started worrying most about an epidemic in the 1980s. That's when the, um, the definition of an epidemic of loneliness 
was yeah. coined. And as, as you know, there's been periods in history which it re, it's reminiscent of the moral panics of the 18th century where there was a fear of emotional contagion. Uh, yeah. that people would feel the same or you know and it's been given rise to various points when there's been outbreaks of suicides for instance where people feel emotionally contagious um it's only really from the 1960s that people have worried about the epidemic that is coined uh, in the 1980s i agree with you about the different studies um the one of the challenges for me is that many of the ways in which we measure loneliness are fundamentally flawed. Yeah. If you look at something like the UCLA loneliness survey, it imagines or presupposes the definite negative approach to loneliness in the first instance. And the questions are structured in such a way is that there's no nuance, there's no consideration of change over time. Um, and fundamentally, it becomes difficult for people to talk about the ways in which they might enjoy being lonely. Yeah. One of the things that I experienced during the first lockdown was a number of people would write to me about how happy they were to be locked down and how happy they were to be lonely. So there's no need to kind of presume that it's always going to be negative. Um, yeah. But another important thing is that I, I think once we have the language of an epidemic um, from the 1980s, it becomes very difficult to think outside of that. So inevitably, we use this language and we ask people, as the BBC Loneliness Survey did recently, we ask them to measure their loneliness. And if loneliness has become, um, you know, a stand for many hats, then any sort of experience that is transitory, any number of different kinds of emotions involved will be labelled as loneliness. Yeah. And, and, and I know that also um, this issue about international levels of loneliness is interesting because, of course, that whole idea about collectivist cultures versus individualistic cultures would suppose there was more loneliness in individualistic countries. But what we find actually is that in countries that are supposedly more collectivist, although with globalization, it's very difficult to disentangle this. Um, what we find is that people are more comfortable talking about being lonely um, in cultures where there's a more kind of uh, collectivist approach to things. Yeah, uh, of course, I fully agree with you that most of those tests are, they have significant weaknesses and just comparing results from different studies is a real nightmare uh, because just a slight change of phrasing will have an impact on what results uh, you, you get. So I, I usually say the most you can use these studies for is that if you've asked the questions in exactly the same way, mm -hmm. you can compare two areas or you can say something about a development over time. That's pretty much it. So whenever we have these reports that such to such large percentage of the population is lonely, I think it's nonsense. I mean, the answer is way too precise. The question does not allow for such a precise answer. Um, so, uh, I, so that they should all be taken with a huge pinch of, of salt, uh, even yeah. comparing results within the country yeah. is, is difficult, I, yeah. and then I, comparing I, results between countries, I mean, it's, it's an open nightmare of the sources of mistakes, yeah. It, well, it is, and it also means that they're, they're, what happens is that we just get lots of political sound bites. Um, yeah. We don't end up with any real dialogue about the social reasons why people are lonely, how loneliness is even conceived at different points in time for different communities, let alone what we should be doing to address loneliness, where it is chronic, where it is attached to serious health problems, where it's attached to inequity, where there is um, what I refer to as structural loneliness, which is that sense of absolute isolation and impoverishedness that we find in refugees and homeless people, for instance. Um, by contrast to the existential loneliness that might be just part of, of everyday life. And I do think it's critical too to think about these differences between the chronic and the transitory. Um, all too often we just, because we lump everything together and we think it's this thing that we can compare across cultures, um, it, it ends up, as I say, with a lot of political sound bites, but not much action. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, I've, I've worked with quite a few different fields, but I think that this is one in which it has been particularly difficult mm. 
to actually get people to, uh, especially politicians, but also uh, the media, to listen to proper research, take, mm. taking yeah. proper research mm. into account, because there is already a set story there, mm. and there's very little willingness mm. to modify that story in any sort of way, no matter what sort of evidence you, mm. you, you show to. And I've been in heaven knows how many discussions with our Minister of Health about this. He's clearly dead set on this epidemic idea. Yes. So, well, we have the Minister for Loneliness in the UK, which yeah. is the first of these. You're even worse but, off. <laughs> the, uh, but, they, uh, but they gave her the job in 2018, where she's since yeah. resigned, but they gave, um, they gave the MP the job in 2018 at precisely the time that they were slashing social and health budgets and people were inevitably more lonely because they were more destitute. So it, that's what I mean by it becoming a sort of political soundbite. Yeah. And you also mentioned that the people who had said that oh they were perfectly happy with the lockdown uh, and uh, um, i might mention that we also did the national uh, institute of public health here in norway did a huge survey because they had done a very large survey just prior to the outbreak of the corona which was great timing and one of the questions uh, a few of the questions that were loneliness related yeah. here luck of course and then they could ask exactly the same subjects exactly the same questions uh, a month or so after the first lockdown had ended and everybody had expected to see a huge rise in the report of loneliness uh, as it turned out there was a small decline slightly fewer people felt lonely after the lockdown than, than before and of course that's the big numbers of course a lot of people struggled a lot more with loneliness during the mm. lockdown but probably a lot of people also got to be even close more closely attached to others also during the lockdown because they were actually locked down i think that's right i think the variability is key yeah. isn't it i mean for people who are in unhappy relationships then lockdown would have been pretty traumatic i mean a huge rise in domestic violence cases and abuse against children um and online abuse of children during this period um but i think this issue about measuring attitudes and measuring loneliness during the pandemic is fascinating we had similar surveys in the uk not as rigorous um but similar questioning about people's experience during the the lockdown and and at first there was this emphasis on the wonderful opportunities of a re revival of community and you know knocking on your neighbor's door and making sure that people are fine and the sense that things could be different but what was fascinating to me is that then loneliness became more reported about halfway through lockdown and i think it's because there's much more in intensity about masks and much more resentment and honestly the sort of polarization of political discussion um, causes people to feel that they don't really belong in a community or they're they're antagonistic towards other people I mean the whole discussion that we find in the US and the UK in particular today is very much about opposites and about um, people not playing their role. So this antagonism about masks as a sort of symbol for whether or not you care about other people became really important in the UK, I think. Yeah, uh, and related to that, one finding that was in this national survey was that levels of generalized trust mm. were slightly lower. And um, and of course, it's, it's not a huge surprise in a situation in which everybody could possibly in fact uh, anybody else but uh, it's still it's pretty troublesome and uh, and of course uh, one of the main points in my book is of course this correlation between trust and loneliness because that's a pretty robust find that individuals with a high level of generalized trust tend to be less lonely people with low levels of generalized trust tend to be more lonely and we not only we do not only observe that on in the, an individual level also if we look at the levels of generalized trust in different countries we find that that's a pretty strong correlation and i assume that this is probably why norwegians of all people uh, pro perhaps have the lowest loneliness prevalence on earth because we have by far the highest uh, levels of generalized trust. We're, we could say we're the most naive population on earth. We trust everybody. Uh, 
but of course that can, that can be a great uh, resource because it creates a certain immediacy. Uh, if levels of trust are in decline, as we know that they are uh, a few places, especially in the US, levels of generalized trust, they've really plummeted. If my hypothesis is correct, we would expect to see a pretty significant rise, all, although with a delay of loneliness there. Yeah, I, th I think wherever there is um, a lack of trust, there is also um, increased loneliness. I've, I've no doubt about that. And, and certainly someone like Hannah Arendt would say that that's actually very functional. It's very functional, particularly for um, politicians who have um, ambitions to be dictators, to separate people, to make them feel opposed to other people and to create this sense of social unease. So I think, I often wonder when there's all this political discussion about the epidemic of loneliness, just how functional it might be um, in some ways. Yeah. Um, I thought that we did touch a little bit on this earlier, but just now towards the end, there is, of course, this question of individualism, individualization. And again, uh, I turn to Norway. We, uh, uh, the second largest percentage of one person households on, on Earth in certain parts of Oslo, uh, it's 70% of the households, one person households. Uh, and I would have expected that that would have that sort of pretty extreme individualization would have led to increased levels of loneliness. Only it, it, it didn't. And it seems that this whole experience of living alone has changed somewhat. Whereas earlier, it used to be sort of your destiny, something you had to do, uh, you were forced to do. But these days, at, at least for a lot of people, it's more of a choice. And of course, that changes how you see it. And there is, a, and what emerges is a different kind of sociality rather than a given sociality or a given community it's a, more of a chosen sociality and a chosen community mm. so whereas the one person households the piece the people in those tended earlier to be more lonely mm. we really don't find that to the same same, same extent yeah. anymore because that way of living has changed yes that makes sense to me and i think one of the um, the challenges in historians of, of demographic change is the presumption that being in a single household means that you're more lonely. Well, of course, we've we've already discussed and we know that loneliness and aloneness are different things. Yeah. Um, I think when I talk about individualism, I'm talking about the construction of a particular type of selfhood and identity of the self as being separate from others that we find characteristic of uh, political, social, economic and philosophical change and medical change fundamentally in seeing ourselves as individualistic beings by contrast to other people. You know, mind and body are separated from one another. People are separated physically and philosophically from one another. And that process is a long one. And as a historian of the long durée, that's what interests me. Um, so although we have this very recent language of an epidemic, I think that it attaches to much longer historical trends that, that are far more than just whether or not we live with other people. Yeah. Well, we've talked for about half an hour. Do you think we should turn to the Q&A? Yeah, I think we should. I think there's some good questions coming through. <laughs> Absolutely. Th thank you both so much. That was excellent. And luckily, we can supplement your discussion with some also excellent questions from the audience. So this one just popped in from Barbara Wilson. And it's a very interesting question, especially relevant to our current situation. She asked, for those of us who are cited, trust is intrinsically linked to reading others' facial expressions. Do you think that young children's emotional intelligence may be permanently impaired by missing this crucial stage in their development, especially if it, presumably, this idea of non-embodied 
interactions <clears throat> continues for a long time. So, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting one about to what extent, you know, mediated conversations via digital platforms can offer similar levels of, say, trust, um, social bonding, decrease of, of loneliness, and whether in the absence of that, there may be some repercussions to certain children at a very crucial developmental stage. So I'm not, not necessarily going to put it to either of you. You can just jump in. If, if I, I, yeah, I'm really <laughs> interested in this question because my current project is to work on the history of faces and facial expressions. Um, and one of the things that's come out in my loneliness research is how often the ability to read a person's face and understand emotions is separate from a person's loneliness. So the more lonely a person becomes, the more unable they are to read um, the expressions of others. And that's partly connected to the issues about trust and distrust that Lars referred to. But there's also something more fundamental about how we emote and engage and how we how we feel that we are seen by other people. I don't think that we are in any danger of children becoming impaired because of having to move online or because of short term um, not being able to see people or even mask wearing. I think all of these things are, are just, you know, part and parcel of, um, you know, the long nature of, of human existence. And I think that the only problem with doing lots of online discussion like this is that you can't, you know, you miss a lot of um, body language cues and you miss a, being able to experience a sensorial um, nature of being around other people. So I think there's something there about touch um, and that sort of sensorial embodiment, but I, I really don't think that, that, that we have to worry about that um, personally. Lars, would you like to add anything or would you like me to throw a different question in your direction? <laughs> okay. I mean, th there's a couple to do with technological mediation. So I'll ask Lars this. So there's one from Pamela King and she asks, is there an overlap between the claims that online social media usage and the social isolation of the pan pandemic have encouraged a greater disconnect and hence a loneliness? And linked with that, Anastasia Babash asks, what do you think about modern technologies and how they affect loneliness? Do they help to overcome it? Because like now we can talk through Zoom or do they make it even worse because now we prefer online conversations to offline? So I, I guess it's about the ambiguous role mm, of technology yeah. in our experiences of loneliness. Yeah, it, 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 it's a tricky one and an and, and interesting one because as I said earlier, when, when I crunched the numbers from the Norwegian statistics, I mean, I had expected to see a huge increase. And in the midst of these decades, we have this whole social media explosion. And I found it so surprising that it did not appear to even have the slightest impact on reported levels of, of, of loneliness. And uh, I was just amazed. To see that because I, I was convinced that it, it would have that sort of impact. When we look a little bit closer, uh, if we now look away from the pandemic for a moment and, and we look at users of social media, what we find is that the heaviest users of social media also have the most face-to-face -face encounters with others. They're just really, really sociable people. Uh, so, uh, what we also, but we do find that the people who use social media the most report slightly higher levels of loneliness uh, than others. And of course, that would lead you to think, aha, so social media, they do create loneliness. Not necessarily, because one really peculiar finding I had when I looked into the Norwegian data was that people who meet their friends face to face every single day are more lonely than people who do not meet their friends as frequently. It's just people, these people, they have huge social needs and they will, it will take less for those needs not to be satisfied. Um, so, and, uh, and of course, I, I mean, I, I get worried sometimes thinking about, for instance, my daughter, isn't she spending too much time alone in her room? Uh, 
but then I see that she's actually interacting with her friends all the time through a cell phone and an iPad and so on. So there is, of course, social transactions going on there. Whether that's those social transactions are inferior or if they would be more likely to lead you to a state of loneliness. I, th I don't think that there's very strong evidence that it does. It, it might do, but so far it doesn't appear to, to be that way. I'm, I'm sure that some people get more lonely, whereas for others, it creates an opportunity for them to socialize that they otherwise would not have had. So it will have different sort of effects for, for different, uh, different people. Um, yeah. You want to follow up on this way? Yeah, well, I agree. I think it's the variability that's important. And yeah. ever since um, technological interventions have been produced, people have thought that it's going to lead to the downfall of civilization. And when the telephone was invented, people worried that nobody would be able to do face-to-face -face communication anymore. And women in particular would spend so long talking on the phone that they would miss, you know, they would abandon their husbands uh, and their children. So there's always been a lot of presumptions about what we do with technology and a fear of it. I think the research that I have done shows that it's it's what you do with it that matters, as with so many things. So if you have a lot of in real life relationships or some that are satisfying, then online relationships enrich them. Um, people who are most lonely as a result of uh, an, an increased uh, digital online engagement with other people tend to be most lonely because they don't have any in real life friendships at all, which brings us back to this idea about sensorial engagement with others. You sit in a cafe, you can smell coffee, you can, you know, you can, all of the wonderful sounds that are about being human and the smells and, and being able to touch other people, all of that is missing in digital engagement. Um, and in the short term, it doesn't matter in the slightest. And for some people, it won't matter at all. So I think it's about variability and being able to use these resources in the best ways that we can. And we wouldn't be able to do this today, would we, if we didn't have Zoom? Mm. Actually, on a related to this, a question's just come in from Alexis Papazoglu. Um, picking up on the point that you and you both have been making, he, he says, is the problem not that many people use social media as spectators rather than mm. participants and that it yeah. is this spectator mode that tends to make us feel lonely? That's fascinating because online relationships replicate entirely offline relationships. So that sort of spectator role tends yeah. to be the people who lurk in social conversations anyway and don't get involved. So they just replicate the ways in which that we do things already. So I think that's right. One thing I, I might add is that I, I think that our competence for dealing with loneliness might become slightly impaired by the emergence of social media. Because, I mean, uh, I'm so old, I turned 50 this year, that I can remember the old days when we did not have cell phones. Uh, and of course, if you were waiting for a train or a bus or an airplane or whatever, these pockets of empty time emerged in which you actually had to relate to yourself. It's not like that anymore. Whenever those pockets of time appear, I pull out this and I open the Facebook app and I invite the entire social field into this pocket. Uh, and I'd say that our capacity for turning loneliness into solitude might be in, in decline, that we, we're getting less capable of dealing with solitude. That might be a result from the emergence of uh, social media and, and, and the, uh, the latest technologies. You know, just to add to that, because I think you're right, Lars, is that sense that it's not just about not being able to cope with, with solitude, but it's also not seeing the benefits, the health benefits and the social and physical benefits of solitude and actually spending time alone, uh, whether that's getting more sleep or just spending time in contemplation. These are, these are valuable things that we don't tend to appreciate. Yes, yeah, so certainly that was a theme that came up in 
your essay for the new issue fair, you, you do touch upon the intimate link between solitude and say religious life where mm. there has often been a premium on lack of stimulation mm. extreme and actually li linking with that there's a question from um joanna seaphone um she asked how seriously are we to take the concept of species loneliness are we more lonely overall because of increased alienation from the natural world could the concept perhaps help perhaps help serve as a tool for coping with loneliness, i.e. turning to the natural world for connection where the social world fails us. So I suppose this almost plays to the um, dichotomy between the technological and the natural world in mediating our experience of loneliness. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in this because I think there's lots of evidence that engagement with nature does increase mental, uh, mental well-being. Um, and also, as well as uh, religious beliefs connecting people and making them feel they're part of something, actually environmentalism does the same thing. So there's lots of secular ways in which we can feel part of something. And whether it's the romantics kind of wandering lonely as a cloud, or it's people being able to spend time in gardens during lockdown, we know that there's something restorative about being in nature and that it makes people feel that they belong to something bigger than themselves. The challenge, of course, is that access to nature is privileged. So for very many reasons, people living in flats and people unable to access the natural world uh, during lockdown was a real problem. Um, so I, I do think that we need to think much more seriously about that sort of connectedness to the natural world as well as other people. Yeah. And how about you, Lars? Yeah. Obviously, you wrote your latest book was on animals and animal minds. And I, I'm guessing you'd probably say that animals aren't lonely. It is a sort of a a fallen human condition. I mean, perhaps if they're in, no, I think there's in, there's uh, there, there's animals can definitely uh, be be lonely. And uh, actually, there was a chapter on animal loneliness in my uh, book on loneliness, <laughs> but it didn't fit into the book. So that was the beginning of my next. Uh, that, that was why I began the next book on, on, on animal um, minds. Uh, and, and, I, and I would say that uh, there's a certain kind of loneliness that I've never experienced in the presence of my dog. I mean, there's a certain immediacy there in the relation that would completely preclude certain kinds of, of loneliness. Apart from that, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the typical uh, Norwegian. I mean, of course, I have a cabin in, in the middle of the woods and go there and I never feel lonely. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, would be uh, certainly much more likely to feel uh, lonely in the, the midst of a big city. But I mean, to, to bring in sort of the idea, I mean, would you say that loneliness is, I don't know if it's the right word, but kind of ontological, like to bring it back to your book on boredom, when the hamster kind of stands there and spins away on, on its wheel for hours on end, is that because it's bored or are we just kind of imposing our categories onto certainly i mean uh Kierkegaard, danish philosopher of course it describes the the self as a relation that relates to itself <laughs> uh but it also relates to other selves who relates to itself and Of course, there is something ontological here. I mean, the, of course, we, we, we have this awareness of the fact that, to, at least to some extent, there is something inherently private about our experience of the world. You can have the closest friend or closest loved one and so on, but there will always be something that cannot be fully shared. And of course, the reason why we Put such huge on it's such a huge emphasis on, on on friendship and love relationships is of course the belief that this state can be at least partially overcome the problem is of course that we have idealized friendship and re romantic relationship to such an extent that they really cannot live up to uh, what they're presented as, but that there are certain aspects of 
being human, namely having this capacity to be aware of yourself as distinct from other selves. Say that there is some level of loneliness there, sure. But, but I think that when we read, and of course Bertrand Russell was occupied with that. But, but, but when we're talking about loneliness more as a social problem, as a social phenomenon, we're not exactly there. Then we would rather look at, for instance, the people suffering from chronic loneliness. And that's an entirely different state. I mean, these are people who really, they feel lonely no matter what their social surroundings are. Um, and that sort of really profound loneliness is something different from the ontological or metaphysical loneliness, I'd say. Yeah, so, so there's a question here which I'll, I'll put to, to Faye, which um, it's from Gina Ben Aharon, and it's, what is the strongest indicator of loneliness? Does having a strong sense of purpose have an effect on loneliness? So I guess it's a question about the most critical conditions. I mean, you've already talked about certain things to do with, um, you know, the disparities of loneliness amongst different classes in the UK and different opportunities. But I guess it's maybe a broader question about other components that predict loneliness or lack of loneliness. Yeah, and loneliness very famously doesn't have an opposite, um, a linguistic opposite. Although social neuroscientists talk about it in terms of loneliness being connected to hunger. So a sort of physical sense that something is wrong, that something is missing. And I think linguistically, the most um, likely opposite is something around connectedness and a sense of connection. Um, and I suppose in terms of one's experience of loneliness during the course of one's life, that will change uh, depending on, on the relationships that one has. Um, why I'm particularly interested in the body as an emotion historian, um, and I've worked a lot on different parts of the body, different ways of um, using metaphor to describe emotional experience. And what strikes me as a way of understanding the connectedness or its lack within other people is by focusing on the body. Um, so we find GPs now, general practitioners, are advised to, to observe a person's behaviour and demeanour to see whether they are lonely. So they look out for whether or not they're washed properly. Have they got uh, decent clothes on? Do they look well fed? And these are all um, things, of course, that we associate with depression and anxiety anyway. So we're immediately presuming that loneliness is always going to be associated with depression and anxiety. But what we can find when we, whether we're observing it in ourselves or we're observing it in others, is that people tend to embody loneliness in very distinct ways. So lonely people tend to crave hot food and drinks. They tend to want hot baths. There's a sense that the lonely body is kind of replicating the sense of social coldness and alienation that's being described. Um, people who are lonely are, are far more likely to be um, addicted to shopping or to seek for material comforts um, in place of emotional and social comforts. And these sociological trends are very interesting because there's hints that actually even with people with dementia, even with people who are um, not able to communicate, they can communicate through material goods. So you can discover whether or not people are lonely by how they interact with the material world. And, and that sense of self in body, in society, engaging with the material world is how I think we really need to start understanding how we experience loneliness as well as how we identify loneliness in other people. And we don't do that when we talk about mental health and we, you know, create groups where people can just chat. There's something much more physical at work. And to return actually to what Lars was talking about in the beginning about gender, there's these fantastic experiments like Men in Sheds, that's an Australian uh, development. And you get people working alongside. So you get men who don't want to talk about their emotions working on woodwork alongside other men. And it gives that sense of fulfillment and the sense of companionship because ritualistic things that we do in companion with other people like dancing or, you know, massage, or, or those sorts of things tend to make us feel like we belong, if, even without talking about how we're feeling. Um, yeah, so embodiment, that's where it's at, I think. Mm. 
It was interesting, like, that your talk of um, kind of metaphors related to these things and in the body, and you touched earlier on, well, on touch and, and the ways in which that is maybe, a, I, I, I guess we tend to think in terms of vision mainly, but it, it sort of reminded me in your colleague, Matt, Matthew Ratcliffe's work, he, he sort of talks about um, intimacy and touch, like, for example, the metaphors, things seem intangible, feeling out of touch with the world, losing yeah. our grip on things. There's all these ways in which that embodied sense kind of permeates mm -hmm. the world. So I, I think that's really an interesting factor in, in loneliness. But Lars, there was a question that seemed very pertinent to you, because obviously you've written on boredom and loneliness, um, but I'm not sure if you focus specifically on melancholia. So this is from Judith Sakal from Mexico City. Hello, Judith. Um, she asks, in which way can you relate melancholia to loneliness? Is loneliness an element within melancholia or is it the other way around, understanding melancholia as the element that brings the emotion to the loneliness as the frame of the situation? So I guess it's about which is the, the primal element. Is it the melancholia or the loneliness and how do they relate? I mean, you may not feel that's kind of something you address much, but I thought as you've done boredom and loneliness, you probably... I, I guess that, that uh, given uh, giving the sort of bodily connotations of, of melancholia, uh, perhaps Faye has something, and as a historian, you would have something to bring to the table here, because I actually think that's, that question is far more suited for you than for me. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Well, yes. Yeah, so, so traditionally, that one of the reasons that I became interested in understanding emotional embodiment is that um, between the second and the eighteenth centuries, medical understandings of the body were a, a composite of four different humours, and the degree of humour that one had in one's body uh, that was um, part influenced by the soul, but influenced by gender, by age, by ethnicity, by environment, by how you moved, how you slept, what you ate. All of these things gave our emotional, um, our emotional experiences meaning. So for people who had a, a significant degree of black, um, of black humor or melancholia, they were much more likely to be uh, depressed and much more likely to be isolated from others. And traditionally women had more melancholia in their body than men. So men had more colour and they were much more fiery. Women were much more tearful. So we have these kind of gendered tropes about emotions and the body even then. But what we don't have is this sense, as I said earlier, of loneliness being a negative state. What we do have is this idea that solitude and too much time on your own could produce too much melancholy in the body. So it's all about balance because you need the spirits to kind of uh, burn off all of these humours and you need this appropriate balance. So these melancholia links with solitude were there quite early on. And the cure for that, doctors would suggest that the cure for that was horse riding and talking to people more, which, um, you know, but that was to move the spirits, to invigorate the spirits and make us happier. Um, so there's those those traditional roots and melancholia has a very, very long history. It's just that those are the ones that we tend to focus on in relation to loneliness, whereas, of course, there's also quite positive experiences that can be linked to loneliness, particularly in terms of creativity and being able to look inward in the work of people like Virginia Woolf, for instance, or Mace Art and this sense of of creativity providing a space to withdraw from the world uh, to reflect and to to live differently. Okay, super. So we're almost at the end, but there is a question just come in from Jana Bacevic, who was um, one of the participants in the event last night, um, or last night for me at least, not for um, her interlocutor. She, she writes, quite a few people report feeling lonely in relationships. Does this tell us something important about loneliness as related to quality rather than quantity? This would certainly explain why social media and absence of face-to-face -face contact don't change things. Um, is there anything you want to say on that, Lars? Because that does touch on a few things you were saying. Um, uh, I think one thing I could mention, if, if we look at the group of lonely people, people who describe themselves as lonely, 
would typically also relate to their partner in a way that slippers that differ slightly from the non-lonely. They would, for instance, to a greater extent, believe that their partner is withholding negative ideas about them. They also believe that uh, really, uh, really pos positive remarks and uh, they aren't truthful. So, I mean, th there is this, we're coming back to the, the sense of distrust. Uh, trust also plays out here. There is less trust in the relationship in which one is, one of the partners is, is lonely. So it also has an impact there. On the other hand, of course, you can also be in a dysfunctional relationship a relationship that really does not provide the sort of attachment that you need, which in turn creates loneliness. Um, but I mean, it, if you feel lonely in your relationship, it, it might be because you're the sort of person you are, or it might be because your partner falls short of what he or she should be. Uh, I mean, there's no general answer here. <laughs> Yeah, my girlfriend just texted me saying stop smiling because it sort of resonates with a few yeah. things. But any, anyway, like um, I, I think unfortunately we're going to have to to draw it to uh to uh um to an end. I mean um, we could do like a very very quick like twenty second answer on the future of loneliness, Faye. <laughs> Did you have any thoughts on the future of I, loneliness? I think if we want to have a more informed understanding of loneliness, then we need to think about its complexities and how it appears differently in people's lives, which is why I called my book a biography of loneliness. It changes over time. What is the loneliness that matters and what's it caused by? And without that, then we just end up with a series of political sound bites or a sense of loneliness as being some universal, inevitable thing, which I don't think it is. Yeah. Buzz, any any um, sooth saying? I would just say that what we need here is really to take a step away from all the alarmism that we find in, in politics and in the mass media and try to take a sober look at this phenomenon in order to come to terms with it in, in, in a sensible way, really. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw it to a close there. That was a really excellent um, discussion between the two of you. Excellent questions. As ever, apologies to the many people whose questions did not get asked. A reminder that you can read Faye's excellent <laughs> essay in the new issue of The Philosopher. I'm sort of getting tired of plugging it every day, but I kind of need to do that. And um, yeah, the, we're, we're back tomorrow because it's every day this week and it's an event between three philosophers who are um, very much oriented towards public philosophy. Um, Adam Ferner and Darren Chetty have written a book called How to Disagree. So it's about the nature of, you know, the kind of we, the we's that we um, envisage for the public space and how discourse can either be productive or fractious. So they're going to be in conversation with Grace Lock Robin, and I'll put up some details of that in a second. So thank you so much to you both, Lars and Faye. That was a really great discussion. And um, thank you for everyone who attended. And yeah, I will put up details of the next event once. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye.